Hello, everyone. I'm just setting up my presentation. And uh, we are going to start just in one minute. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, uh, a lot of people are joining through YouTube and they are catching up with the information later. Uh, anyway, I will be letting uh, in those who are uh, deciding to join Zoom uh, throughout the pro presentation as usual. So welcome everyone who cares for Ukraine and who cares for the small family farms and agricultural industry in Ukraine and throughout the world. Today uh, is going to be our uh, 12th, 12th bi-weekly that we are uh, organizing in order to bring the information from the uh, two types of fields, battlefields and agricultural fields from Ukraine. So for those who hasn't uh, seen us uh, or hasn't heard about us uh, before, I would like to tell you a few words about our program. It is the, uh, the first five minutes I will devote to the world to rebuild rural Ukraine program. This is the charitable initiative that we launched since the beginning of the war in order to support the families, the farm families in uh, rural Ukraine, in the villages of Ukraine, who suffered from Russian aggression, uh, whose houses were damaged and uh, who were left by themselves in under the open sky, uh, not able to proceed farming, not able to... Uh, uh, rebuild themselves and uh, get some financial aid either from the government or from the uh, banks in a uh, form of loans. So uh, we have uh, identified the target uh, stratum of the society who gets our help and uh, we are working with them uh, only with, with these people. Uh, in order to help them, we focus on four types of things. First is rebuilding their houses. That is creating the uh, ability for them to uh, live somewhere uh, when the winter is coming, to stay over the winter and not just uh, live outside in the sun as it has been all these months. Uh, I'm sorry, there is some kind of a window that is closing the, the picture. Just a second. Let me restart. Okay. Yes, now it's better. So <clears throat> this, the second is uh, rebuilding the facilities of the farms, that is storage facilities, their barns, their uh, garages, uh, greenhouses, and so on. And of course, helping them repurchase the machinery so that they are able to proceed doing farming and repurchase their farm animals. Because there were cases, unfortunately, that uh, Russians were just simply stealing live animals from those people, taking them on the tanks with their legs tied back to Russia or Belarus. And our uh, uh, aid recipient, Alexander, his father used to own 80, 80 sheep, and within two weeks, Russians have uh, uh, slaughtered and uh, stolen uh, majority of them. So he was left with only 12. And this is a well-known proven fact that Russian army, when they came to Ukraine, they had no supply of food or whatsoever. They were supposed to be finding food themselves by uh, looting and stealing. So our program, in order to be transparent, and uh, uh, free of any um, corruption, we invited a reputable people throughout the world, people from the science and people from the agricultural industry to help us make the right decisions. This is how we created Board of Ambassadors. This is the uh, department, so to say, in our program, who not only oversee how the money, the donated money are spent, is spent, but uh, they influence our decisions. So every penny that is being spent needs approval of the Board of Ambassadors. And here's what's important. 
anyone who joins the program, who donates uh, or helps the program and is willing to join the Board of ambassador is Ambassadors is welcome to join. So there is no limit for the amount of people on the Board of Ambassadors. And this is how we are becoming better and better in what we do. There are two important principles. We never give off cash. Instead, we give the services of rebuilding or repurchasing, and we never upgrade. So if there was a tractor, 120 horsepower uh, that uh, Alexander had, we will be looking for the similar tractor or the tractor within the same uh, budget so that he knows how to utilize it and he knows uh, and he will get the most of it. So uh, we are asking anyone who can help to do the following couple of things. If possible, of course, donate. In order to be uh, transparent, we have partnered with LifeNet. This is the American um, NGO, and they have a highest score, 100 out of 100, according to the third-party estimation, Charity Navigator. So they collect this money and then transfer them uh, the, uh, the, the donations to Ukrainian account of Ukrainian NGO and uh, then the uh, but it is done only after the board of ambassadors approved the spendings also we um, want to uh, give off something back for each of the donations and <clears throat> there are two ways what uh, people who donated can get instead first it is the $200 uh, donation exchanged for the uh, access to our online courses. And these online courses are uh, available through, uh, throughout the, the globe. Uh, we have collected the technological information on production of five crops, application of uh, fertilizers and micronutrients. So these people get free access for lifetime to these courses. And the second is traveling. Uh, the nearest group that we are uh, recruiting for the uh, agricultural tour is the tour to New Zealand in December. So if somebody donated $200 uh, towards World Tour Rebuild Rural Ukraine, he or she gets uh, a discount uh, equal to $200 to the donation uh, uh, for this trip. And if you want to get more information about these options, uh, this is all on our website and just go follow the QR code or go uh, to wruu.org. This is our website. Also, it is very important and it is our secondary mission to spread the word. That is why I'm here today and I will be here in two weeks uh, doing the bi-weekly uh, along with my team with our team uh, of Travelite, <clears throat> we are bringing the true information from the fields of Ukraine about the real life of these people and the real situation in the battlefields and in agricultural fields. Because in this era of Russian propaganda, it is very important to bring the precisely true information so that our allies would know how to do and what to act, there, uh, how to act and what to do. Therefore, uh, we are welcome, we, we are open for any interviews, for any meetings with people, with uh, decision makers of big companies, and of course, uh, media interviews. If you can help us arrange those, we will be grateful, and you can contact me on this following this email. This is our team in Ukraine who helped me make sure that uh, we have information to present to you and also who help work with the actual aid recipients uh, in Ukraine who we work with. And currently we have three. I will talk about them a little later. Now let's go to the current topics that I would like to cover uh, with you today. First of all, yesterday it, is, uh, it was a sad day for the United Kingdom because the uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II passed away in the age of 96 years, and it was just in June that she celebrated her anniversary of being the Queen of the United Kingdom uh, for 70 years. 
and uh, she has become not only the lady made of iron, like a symbol of uh, uh, <clears throat> power and uh, justice, but she was always a, a symbol of style and a lot of uh, uh, women throughout the world were taking example from her style. Uh, <clears throat> also an interesting fact about uh, Her Majesty and uh, uh, her hobbies, so to say, is that she was uh, quite uh, uh, interested or keen in horses and uh, they had uh, the farm, they have the farm uh, with cows, uh, Jersey cows, Sussex beef herd, and uh, so the livestock farm. Uh, this is our topic, that's why we couldn't but uh, uh, mention it. So in addition to ruling the country and influencing, providing such a serious and uh, um, overwhelming, so to say, in a positive meaning word of the word, effect to the uh, global policy, uh, Her Majesty, she was also involved in simple agricultural things like the uh, uh, livestock farm. Now let's go to Ukraine. So the current news were um, a little bit astonishing positively, but uh, at the same time uh, expected. The counter-attack or counter-offensive uh, movement in Ukraine have start movements have started since the beginning of this uh, month. However, uh, our um, officials were keeping silence in order not to provide too much information about what's going on uh, in the battlefields to uh, the Ru Russian forces. Therefore, uh, we received this information only yesterday and uh, it's still in, in the process of being delivered. What has happened? At first, the president of Ukraine announced or gave an order to start preparing for the counter-attack, counter-offensive uh, operation in the south, so in Kherson. And uh, they, uh, of course, this information was um, uh, official and it was at the media. So Russians brought more forces to Kherson Oblast. But instead, Ukrainian armed forces, they started the counter-attack from the northeast part of Ukraine, which is Kharkiv. Kharkiv Oblast, although the city, the capital of the oblast was free, but it was always under the uh, most serious shellings and um, uh, mi uh, missiles, artillery, everything was coming to the city, to the civil uh, blocks. Russians were saying that we must frighten the civilians by these attacks so that they force Ukrainian armed forces to give up. This was officially said at their TVs, but their spokesman. Uh, and therefore, uh, Kharkiv was one of the three cities that suffered most. And for the reason, Ukrainian armed forces started to... Hello. Uh, Alan, please mute your microphone. Okay, just a second, I will, yes, okay. So <clears throat> as a result, uh, we have gained uh, about um, uh, 1,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory since September 1st back. For you to understand, Ukraine is 600,000 square kilometers in area. And right now, 20% of total Ukrainian area is in uh, uh, occupation, under occupation. So little by little, but the process has started. This is the good news. <clears throat> in, uh, that's only in Kharkiv, 400 square kilometers, but I mentioned 1,000. It's because in the uh, south, there are also positive movements towards freeing or liberating our land. Uh, for Kharkiv, this territory is important not only because of protecting the city. You see the blue part. This is what Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian armed forces gained back. But also the supply 
of uh, their uh, troops in more to the south. There is uh, uh, transport artillery going on here through Izum, and this is the next step. Ukrainian armed forces, they want to regain this old territory until Izum, and that was the strong quote for Russians that they meant to use for proceeding to the Kharkiv Oblast. Now, killing this uh, stronghold uh, gets them back in their ex expectations. And for you to uh, remember, Putin has ordered to his forces gain full control of Donetsk Oblast. And you see Izum is here, and here is Donetsk Oblast. So the supply was coming from the north, towards this uh, battalion to fight back Donetsk Oblast by September 14. And this is how we ruined Putin's plans. So far, everything looks good. Let's skip it that way. So it's, I was showing over here. Now let's focus on the uh, work at the back of Russian uh, uh, troops or Russian army. As you know, a lot of supply is coming towards Kherson Oblast and towards uh, uh, Zaporizhia Oblast from uh, Crimea. Unfortunately, we still cannot attack the bridge, the Kerch bridge connecting the peninsula to Russian territory, but we uh, can reach their warehouses and military bases. And with the equipment that we received, thank you very much, allies, United States, Great Britain, and other countries who are supplying uh, those uh, machine, those weapons to us, we are a, we were we have been able to run the so to say modern style of war instead of uh, going into attack and uh, getting uh, mass uh, killings. We are uh, Ukrainian armed forces are uh, destroying the supply chains of those. Uh, uh, weapons and uh, ammunitions and uh, um, uh, all, all the supply of uh, fuel to, to uh, Russian forces. As a result, they are cut out and they don't have a possibility to do what they have been doing or were doing throughout whole summer. All these cities that, and towns that are located next to the uh, a line, main war line, were constantly shelled by artillery. There were thousands of tons or even hundreds of thousands of tons spent daily by Russians uh, shelling the cities. It, uh, it, uh, the targets were not military. Those were just the cities. For example, the city of Nikopol, uh, located just across the Dnieper River, from Enerhodar. It is one of the biggest, um, most suffering cities due to those shellings. Now let's focus a little bit on Kherson Oblast. So Oblast in Ukraine, this is an administrative territory which is similar to a United States state. And uh, it is also uh, similar to American California in the matter of what role it plays in the country. First of all, it is very important uh, territory from the point of view of connecting the Crimean Peninsula. And that's why Russians wanted first to take to capture this oblast in order to get the uh, control and the deliver like the connection, the road uh, with Russia to the east over the continent, but not over the bridge. And yes, there were a lot of questions why Russian armed forces were able to capture this oblast so easily and to pass this uh, neck, this very narrow place here, because it had been claimed to be controlled, to be safe, and to be mined in case of attack from Russians. But in fact, nothing happened and Russians came in very easily. But these are the questions to be answered a little later. Now we need to fight it back. So Kherson, the population is 1 million people. Kherson Oblast, you see the whole oblast. It is 142nd or 45th, because 45 million people, this is the total population of Ukraine. However, it is probably the most agricultural area. 
because with the uh, area of 28,000 square kilometers, it has 2 million hectares of farmland. Let me remind you, the total farmland acreage in Ukraine, hectares in Ukraine is 28. So it is, and we have uh, 25 administrative regions like states, including Crimea. So 2 million, it is more than average per oblast. Also, it is important because Kherson, since the Russian or Soviet times, has been irrigated and it was the area that built a huge uh, network of channels, irrigation channels that supplied water to Crimea and also throughout the farms here. So 21% of its farmland is irrigated. As a result, they can grow soybeans very uh, well, sunflower, canola. You see the main uh, stress, main crops in this uh, area are the oil crops. And there is a reason why, I will explain later. Also due to the warm climate, uh, this is the only region in Ukraine that can grow rice and cotton but uh, it used to be grown there. Right now, it was a little bit uh, uh, devastated, this part of the industry. And um, it, we were just talking about getting back to growing rice and cotton in, in that area in the industrial, uh, on the industrial level. Also, Kherson is famous for its open air vegetables and uh, melon crops, watermelons and melons. They supplied those crops throughout whole Ukraine. And um, uh, Dnieper River was used as the transportation of watermelons from Kherson to uh, uh, Kyiv here, to the main <clears throat> to capital. Unfortunately, this summer we didn't get these watermelons and farmers instead, uh, what I heard from farmers in Kherson, they were leaving watermelons and all this produce, including the, the tomatoes in the fields because the price was so low, the Russians were buying it for the Crimea. And the price was so low that it was below the break-even point and it wasn't worth even to be harvested. So, now, Ukrainian army is focusing on regaining all this oblast. And you see, you have just seen the reason why it is so important. In addition to what I've, I've mentioned, it is uh, if once, because I don't have any doubts that it will be liberated or gained back, once it is uh, re um, returned to Ukraine for the Russian emperor Putin, uh, it will be a devastating precedent because they came there and they were talking um, uh, on the media that Russia came to Kherson and it will never leave. This is our stone code and blah, 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 blah. But in fact, once we gain it back, it will be a huge slap over his face as an emperor and as the military person, as the second biggest army of the world. So we have been uh, creating the situation when the forces that came to Kherson are uh, cut down from the supply. On the right bank, let me show you here. You see Kherson is here and then this is the Dnieper River. They succeeded cross the river and capture Kherson and some part of Mykolaiv Oblast too. Uh, it will be seen over here. Yes, this is better. So <clears throat> uh, we have cut them down from all the bridges were destroyed on this river. And even the barges that they used to cross and to uh, bring supply are not uh, functioning anymore because with the HIMARS uh, missiles, we were able to sunk in a number of them, including one very um, interesting case, it was just yesterday or the day before yesterday, that one barge, agricultural barge, was fully loaded with uh, uh, trucks of people, of supply and weapons. It was covered by, uh, but uh, once uh, the missile hit it, so the people were started, started to jump out, but it went 
under the water very quickly. And majority of the soldiers and, of course, all the equipment was sunk in the Dnieper River. So they used barges to bring back and forth the supply. That possibility is also elimin uh, eliminated. So what do we have right now? The uh, amount of soldiers on this right bank of Dnieper is said to be about 15 to 20,000. All these soldiers need a huge amounts of food and they need huge amount of weapons and, of course, fuel. None of that is available. And Ukrainian armed forces are just waiting. On this, uh, by the way, slide here, I would like, I wanted to show you the uh, channels that come from Kahoka, this is Kherson Oblast, towards the Crimean Peninsula. In 2014, once Russia annexed Crimea, uh, according to the so-called war legislation or the norms of war, the one who invaded the land is responsible for providing supplies to this land and to the people so that everything functions there. Uh, Ukraine shut down the supply of water and in February, in the end of February, once they crossed this, uh, this neck, first thing they did, they attacked the hydropower station uh, in Kahovka that would that had this uh, dam uh, not to supply water to Crimea. But eight years, all of these channels didn't function. And once the water uh, went into the channels, there was, there was said to be a lot of problems with getting is, it to, uh, to the end of the system. Kherson Oblast is also uh, very important from the standpoint of presence of a lot of international and Ukrainian huge uh, corporations. For example, uh, remember I mentioned that main crops are oil crops in uh, uh, this oblast. And we have been uh, uh, processing oil crops since the uh, year 2008 very heavily in order to get the uh, additional profit. So uh, processing adds up profit and uh, company Cargill is the first one who built the oil facility, sunflower oil uh, extruding facility. Then came uh, agrofusion for tomato processing, of course, Chumak, uh, very uh, well-known brand, uh, tomato processing. Uh, Danone are processing 80, 80% of their produce in Kherson Oblast, but uh, supply it to Ukraine. So 80% of all the produce that comes to Ukraine. And of course, eggs. Uh, once avant-garde company, they uh, built one of the state-of-the-art uh, chicken factories there. They started supplying eggs to Ukraine. So this is how big is the agricultural industry in Kherson Oblast. And this is how important this oblast is from the standpoint of uh, food supply to Ukraine and to other countries. Because of course, with the situation when these companies cannot sell, uh, cannot cross a uh, break-even point with the prices for their commodities, they will cease production. The people will be fired and and then there is no more production. And the last thing about Kherson Oblast is that they are the logistical, so to say, center. First of all, they have its own Kherson port. And this is, these are some numbers in millions of dollars of the produce exported from Kherson port to these countries. So for you to understand, even the United States of America uh, received uh, produce coming from Kherson port for $6.1 million. Here are the main countries that get uh, products export from port of Kherson. And for you to, to understand, for you to remember, port of Kherson, uh, it is the entrance to the Dnieper River. And above it, there is Mykolaiv. Over here, there is Mykolaiv, and here is Kherson. Above it, uh, uh, they uh, so all the agricultural vessels or uh, ships coming out from 
uh, Mykolaiv, the second biggest port, but the first biggest agricultural port is coming through uh, Kherson too. Therefore, it is even more important from the uh, logistical standpoint of view. So uh, the main um, position or so to say news, piece of news right now is to keep silent about what is going on in this area. And uh, uh, we know that Russians have evacuated their families from Kherson, that the, uh, those collaborators and those uh, military who came there. So uh, nobody except soldiers is left there. Last time I was telling that I communicated with people from Kherson Oblast. They said that in the very city, there is only 20% of population, probably that's all. The rest have already left. Unfortunately, there are a lot of, there still continues a lot of shelling to the civil objects. I will not be talking a lot, uh, stopping much at this topic. It has been since the beginning of the war. Uh, Russians are deliberately shelling civil objects. And there is a statistics that shows one military to 13 civil objects every night, especially in the cities that are close to the front line. Uh, the losses. We have uh, been told by our uh, uh, Zaluzhny, our uh, uh, army, Ukraine army commander, Valery Zaluzhny, that uh, Ukraine has lost 9,000 of soldiers. That was as of end of August. Probably it is higher now, unfortunately, but uh, Russian losses are much higher. It means that they are uh, commanders, they don't care about life of their soldiers and they are sending them to death, just as, as, the, uh, I, as the meat, as they call it in Ukraine uh, or in Russia, as the uh, bullet meat. So uh, there were stories told by Ukrainian for, uh, military that they uh, are um, counteracting with the uh, Russians next, so it, it is the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, the uh, most active fights were going on there from the south over there, not from the Izum. And uh, Ukrainian soldiers said that they are psychologically having troubles killing so many Russians because they, ki they keep coming and their bodies lay on the fields. Nobody take them. Now the nuclear threat. Russia continues to threat with nuclear, and you've heard that at, for, at the beginning of this war, there were talks about uh, using the nuclear missiles, then they occupied two of our power plants, uh, one of which still stays under occupation. And the international uh, mission, uh, IAEA, uh, they are responsible for situations like that, and they are issuing the certificates to these uh, um, uh, nuclear power stations uh, so that they could function, so that they could purchase the fuel. Uh, they were finally allowed by Russian soldiers to inspect their uh, station. According to their uh, report, first of all, Russians didn't want any representatives of this organization from Britain, Britain or America, United States, to come, so there are only uh, the there were only representatives from other countries. And by the way, at least thirty to forty percent of their employees are Russians. Those were allowed. They came to the uh, station. They inspected. There was one situation when they asked, "Okay, so here is a missile sticking in the ground. It is thinking as if it." flew from your positions, from where the Russian uh, army is standing, but not as you claim from Ukraine, where one of their uh, spokesmen said, it's the new type of missiles that Ukraine is using from the West. They have uh, received it from the West. It flies uh, and then returns like 180% uh, sorry, uh, degrees return and uh, uh, creates a visual uh, like idea that uh, uh, it 
it came from a different direction. So this kind of nonsense they were trying to sell, so to say, to this uh, mission. And uh, there was also a video uh, showing that there re really is military equipment in the uh, station, inside the buildings of the station, uh, close to reactors. Russians claimed those are the military anti-radiation uh, units. However, that was a military equipment, which is totally forbidden. After that, uh, one of the collaborationists or the person who used to be a Ukrainian politician, but he betrayed Ukraine, he claimed that why don't you shoot a couple of calibers, one of the fanciest uh, Russian uh, missiles, into two other nuclear power stations to see how the rhetoric of the West will change. So this is a threat, uh, one of the many coming from Russians recently connected with the nuclear uh, disaster. Now we are approaching the field, the agricultural fields. And one more topic uh, is the demining of the fields. I've been mentioning many times that uh, the area that must be inspected for mines and for explosives after the war in Ukraine is equaling the size of New Zealand. But uh, uh, not all of it actually has the, the missiles. It's just uh, there is a threat. However, the most uh, uh, active areas are uh, the, the territories that used to be the most active areas of fighting are already inspected and there was about 70,000 hectares inspected and checked for mines and you see how much of the ammunition of the bombs uh, and explosives were taken out from them. Much more to be done and it is a huge budget of course. Now agricultural export. Since the beginning of this uh, grain initiative which is uh, a so to say grain corridor coming through the ports of uh, uh, Black Sea, from the ports of Black Sea, three of them, uh, we were able to export 4.5 million tons of grains, oil seeds, and byproducts just in August, so one month. It is approaching the number that was active before the war, 5.5 to 7 million metric tons, when all the seven ports were functioning and all the logistics was very well fine-tuned. So <clears throat> uh, here uh, is the breakdown of types of export that uh, these 4.5 million metric tons were exported by. And uh, the Black Sea ports is 1.5 million metric tons. So three ports were able to export 1.5 million metric tons of commodities through them. Within the whole year, uh, whole half of the year, whole period of the war, we exported twice less than within the same period, la period last year. Twice less. This speaks a lot. Here is the uh, breakdown of the crops and of the countries that our export uh, commodities were taken to. So first of all, the majority of the commodities are uh, was corn. Then the second was wheat, barley, and other. And the majority of the, the main buyer, 54 ships came to Asia, 16 ships came to uh, Africa, and 32 ships came to Europe. So you see that uh, our main market is actually Asia. And corn, the reason why corn is number one crop uh, exported is, first of all, that it was already prepared uh, close to the ports and it was prepared to be sold. Secondly, because uh, once this corridor started to work, uh, Ukrainian uh, huge corporations were first in line to export. Like, for example, as it was officially stated, that the first ship that came out from these ports was uh, the ship by Colonel, uh, the company, the biggest uh, um, uh, agricultural producer and trader in Ukraine. And uh, they are contracting uh, produce from smaller farmers and buying it all together. So they were the first to start exporting. 
that's probably one of the reasons why so far the price hasn't changed much yet. So, but speaking about this corridor, Putin has started to say that maybe we made a mistake uh, allowing you to export grain. So they want to get this agreement back and again to limit our exportation. Uh, he uh, claimed that instead of bringing, uh, it was the recent economical forum and he was speaking to the African countries and he said that none of Ukrainian grain that was supposed to be sent to your countries came to your countries. Instead, it was sold to Europe, which is total nonsense, nonsense and lie. You see here there is the breakdown on the countries which got the produce. Turkey was one of the main uh, beneficiaries, so to say. And let me remind you, they are buying our commodities at 25% discount. That's another reason why the price for Ukrainian farmers didn't go up very much since the beginning of working of this corridor, just because it is sold 25% less. If one metric ton of wheat is $400, to Turkey, we are selling it for $300. Interesting situation with sunflower. You know that Ukraine is number one producer of sunflower worldwide. You can see it over here. And next is Russia. Of course, limiting the export from Ukraine very uh, radically influences the market of sunflower and sunflower oil. In uh, before, According to Andriy Yarmak, and we have uh, recorded an interview with him last uh, uh, week. It is available on our YouTube channel. Please watch it. Very interesting. He is the food expert uh, who was first to predict that Ukraine will start exporting commodities at the beginning. He was talking about that at the beginning of 2000s. Back then, as all the years before, when for you to remember, United, uh, United uh, Soviet Union <coughs> said, claimed that agricultural production cannot be profitable, it must be subsidized. So they were purchasing oil from Argentina, sunflower oil from Argentina. But in fact, now as agriculture has become a business and it is a prosperous business, profitable business, Ukraine shifted and uh, all that uh, transportation uh, routes and infrastructure was just flipped over from the import. It started to be used for the export. That's what Andriy predicted in 2000. And as I mentioned a couple of slides before, the first oil, sunflower oil processing factory was built in 2008 by Cargill in Kherson. So we started to sell the oil to the international market sometime from 2008. And now we are number one country. We produce 50 half of all the produce of sunflower oil. The next is Russia. So what happens once Russia have captured the territories uh, that are so much in production and processing of sunflower, uh, the uh, market is lacking sunflower. I've noticed it myself when I came to Germany. The first couple of weeks, there was no uh, sunflower oil at all, even vegetable oil. And uh, of course, Russia was getting the best price for their sunflower. They are the second, you see. I remember that the price for sunflower in Poland was over $2,000 for metric ton of sunflower. Whereas in Ukraine at that moment, just within a couple of hundred of kilometers, it was only uh, $400, five times less. And of course, uh, um, it was not that beneficiary or not very that interesting for Russia to open this grain corridor. They were pushed to, to do this. And once the export started to function, uh, our and we have 70 of oil plants, that's like Cargill in 2008. Now we have 7070 of them. They are processing, they are adding value to sunflower that is grown in Ukraine. And 
uh, they are selling oil as well. If you remember, in uh, it seems to me it was in May, Russians attacked the port facility in Mykolaiv, and that was the facilities, the big tanks with sunflower oil uh, ready to be exported. So due to inability to export uh, through the deep sea waters, uh, through the big ports, Ukrainians started to export their raw material. And these 70 sunflower plants were reducing their production, losing, of course, profit, and people were fired. But uh, uh, our export of the raw material as sunflower seed went up very high. The largest number exported 1.3 million within this half, uh, uh, within this uh, season just because we were not able to process. So now it is expected to go down by 30% to 1.2, just because we are able to export the oil, the actual product uh, after processing. <coughs> so the production, um, you know that Ukraine has been uh, under the war for six months, but the farmers never gave up the idea of farming. And even under the shellings and with the, I'm sorry, with the uh, tanks uh, within and helicopters within a couple of kilometers, they were still planting. As a result, we have harvested a little less than 26 million metric tons of the produce. Uh, how much is that? Let me remind you that last year, to 2021, the total harvest with all the crops, winter crops, early spring crops, and late spring crops was about over 80 million metric tons. This was one of the best years. However, this year, to, uh, 2022, has some drought, of course, in uh, eastern and southern areas, but it is a little bit not, not, not that bad. I mean, the nature helped us to uh, survive through it. So 26 million metric tons of the crops were harvested over the territory of 6 million, uh, almost 7 million hectares. Uh, the total acreage of Ukrainian land is uh, 28 million hectares. And usually 8 million out of these 28 comes for the winter crops. The uh, season for planting the future winter crops has started and even last bi-weekly, uh, I was communicating with my friends in Kirovograd. They said that they are already planting uh, canola, winter canola. So seven regions of Ukraine are already planting by, as of now, uh, uh, canola, barley, wheat, and rye. So the planting has started, but this is a very dangerous situation here. According to Denis Marchuk and a lot of other experts, uh, and also Andriy Yarmak, uh, please see his video on our uh, channel. He said, they all say that, first of all, uh, due to inability to sell and free up the storage capacities, secondly, due to inability to find the finances and inputs and due uh, no stability of the sales of the commodities, about 30% of the farmers in Ukraine will be reluctant to do winter crops planting this year. 30% out of 8 million uh, hectares that are used to be planting. 30% uh, that's that's quite huge, especially taking into consideration what comes next. So let's. Uh, this is the information that I got from Andriy Yarmak, and it makes a lot of sense. So our Ukrainian production is, uh, except maybe uh, uh, sunflower oil, is mainly producing raw material, raw material that is used for human consumption in uh, Lebanon and Libya. They are buying Ukrainian wheat, which, which is not the highest grade, but they still use it for uh, making, uh, for baking. So for human consumption. But majority of our produce is 
uh, actually fed to the animals. And uh, then these uh, uh, this produce, they, the, the animals, they produce uh, animal produce like eggs, milk, meat. And of course, then it is consumed by the people. That's how it worked before the war. When our export stopped, and we were not able to provide food for the animals abroad, let's say in, in Turkey or Spain, just as an example, the farmers who were counting on this produce, they needed to buy it for the higher price from other sources if it was available. Therefore, the economy changed dramatically and they had to slaughter number of the animals of the heads of the animals in order to uh, fix the economy and to have enough produce for uh, feeding the, the animals. What do we have at the market of uh, food? Of course, meat goes down because a lot of uh, animals are slaughtered. But then, and this is what Andrei said, next year, starting, uh, I mean, uh, the, starting from this fall, late fall, the prices for meat and animal products, especially in the countries that depend upon Ukrainian commodities, will go up and very dramatically up. And this is not something that can be uh, fixed easily, but by opening the corridor. This is the uh, bomb, so to say, that is already in action. And uh, the wave, uh, explosion wave, is going to come a little later this fall. I'm not claiming this is going to be like this, but I'm just telling you what I've heard from Andrei Yarmak, and uh, he was very um, uh, convincing. Also, and this is what Russia is using in this all war, in this war, uh, this lack of food or food becoming more expensive to people, especially in the developing countries, uh, it leads to the starvation protests of course, to uh, military uh, tackling of these uh, protests and uh, deaths. Of course, massive migration towards the countries that have more food, like European countries uh, and more developed countries, and again, war conflicts. So uh, Russia is deliberately blocking our ability to export food uh, commodities just for the reason to blackmail the Western world uh, to stop us uh, supporting us. Here are the prices. I always bring uh, up this um, chart. Uh, the price, I haven't changed it since the last bi-weekly because it hasn't changed much. The prices are growing in United, Ukrainian hryvnias, but the price of hryvnia is going down, unfortunately. For example, at the beginning of the war, Ukrainian one hryvnia was uh, worth 28, uh, sorry, American one dollar was worth 28 hryvnias. Now it is 42. Therefore, what the price gains in the, uh, what is gained in the price for commodities is lost in this uh, uh, hryvnia to dollar exchange rate. Also, the logistics. Last time I showed this uh, chart, just to remind you that our main um, entrances or corridors of export are located to the southwest of Ukraine and uh, the territories or the oblasts or the farmers that are located further, from, uh, the further they are located, the more they pay for the transportation. This adds up the fuel, expensive fuel, of course, the services of transportation, kilometers, and the dangerousness, because as you see, the war is going on over here. So it is closer to the war zone. And of course, the uh, transportation companies are charging for the risk. Now the capacity. This is the topic that I still haven't succeeded um, understanding fully, because of the difference in these numbers. Ukrainian Latifundist uh, media, they are uh, saying that we have about 57 million uh, metric tons capacity we had at the beginning of the war, capacity of uh, our storage facilities. However, for United Nations, they claim that we have 75. 
Uh, both of these numbers are present in the media right now, and uh, I'm just delivering you the information. But let's go from uh, understanding how much lo we lost. So according to United Nations, we lost 10.5 million metric tons. If it is, uh, if we have total 75, it is 14%. But if we have total 57, it is almost 20%. It's a huge amount. And taking into consideration the narrow export uh, capabilities, it will be filled up very soon with the, uh, with the late, uh, late fall crops. Uh, like uh, Denise uh, said, our uh, project coordinator, he was doing a presentation sometime in July. He said that in this case, he will not be harvesting corn at all. Leave it for the spring. Uh, now I would like to... Uh, we have a guest today, uh, Yevhen Rosoha, and I wanted, uh, first of all, to make sure... Yevhen, are you Uh-huh, Yevhen is not here yet. Let me, uh, let me give him a call and double check if he's... Uh-huh, so we have four minutes before um, he joins. So uh, Yevhen is, uh, I will do a short introduction because he's about to be joining. He's, suppo he's supposed to be uh, here in four minutes. Uh, just a second. I've known him for over 10 years already. He's been a good client and already a friend of mine. We've traveled with him to United States. First time it was the year of 2010. Uh, we went to the state of uh, Washington uh, and worked with Dr. Stephen Van Vliet on uh, the uh, fruit tour. And also uh, we went to uh, California, to Canada. We didn't have a chance to visit New Zealand with him, but that's still in the future. So Yvonne is the head of the uh, state nursery in Bakhmut. It used to be called Artyomos when, I, uh, when we were traveling together, but now it was re renamed to Bakhmut. It is a very active war zone these days. Unfortunately, Yevhen had to be uh, to leave uh, his business and um, his uh, uh, home, and now he uh, came to Kiev so uh, let me, please give me one minute. I will call him and invite him to join a little earlier. Yes, he is joining. Uh, I'm waiting for him to join. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to uh, tell you that um, this December, we are organizing uh, the first commercial project for our team. Uh, this is the tour to New Zealand. Uh, it is 50%, like half farm tour, half is the sightseeing tour. And uh, we um, are inviting, we cannot invite, unfortunately, Ukrainians because of the war. Therefore, this is um, our decision to focus on the international market. And we are inviting anyone who is willing, uh, who speaks English and is willing to join the, the group. Uh, this information about the tour is available at our website, Waru, uh, under these uh, donation options. So uh, if uh, you can, I would be grateful if you could share the information with um, your uh, colleagues and farmers. Uh, I myself will be accompanying this group uh, and uh, it's going to be an interesting tour, uh, but it is the first time that we are focusing not on Ukrainian farmers to provide these services, but rather on the farmers uh, abroad, uh, all countries, all farmers that speak English can join. 
Okay, still waiting for your hand here. Also last, uh, last week, I went uh, with the mission of World to Rebuild Rural Ukraine, uh, went to the uh, Farm Progress Show uh, to Iowa, and it was a very nice uh, event for us. We were invited to exhibit uh, what we've got to say about Ukraine for free. Uh, I had a chance to meet with uh, uh, three representatives to the Congress, um, Randy Finstra uh, from the state of Iowa, Representative Glenn uh, Thompson from the state of Pennsylvania, and Representative Wiki Harsler from the state of Missouri. And of course, we were able to pass the information to the Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Thomas Wilsack. Uh, Wilsack, I'm sorry, Wilsack. I personally uh, handed him my business card and information about World to Rebuild Rural Ukraine. So hopefully soon we will be in, we will be contacted and invited for the uh, for providing more details. This is what we are looking for: an outreach and be able to speak about what's going on in Ukraine. Yevhena, день добрий. Ви вже приєдналися? Да, получилось. Ви мене слышите? Да, чую, чую, дуже добре. Тут да, ми хорошо. маємо на екрані слайди з вашими фотографіями. Якраз в двох словах сказав, звідки ви родом і де ви працювали до початку війни. Скажіть, будь ласка, де ви зараз знаходитесь і яка у вас ситуація, чим ви зараз займаєтесь? So I said that I did a short introduction for, to, for Ivan uh, and uh, I asked him, so where are you right now? Uh, I know that you needed, you had to leave the homeland, so where are you uh, staying right now? Сейчас, конечно, основная задача найти какое-то место для того, чтобы провести зиму. Вот. И сейчас я в Киеве нахожусь территориально и пытаюсь mm -hmm. найти место, где можно там перезимовать. Ну uh, и so, параллельно, да. Uh, Евгений saying that uh, for him the task number one right now is to find uh, a place to live the wind through the winter. Right now he is in Kiev looking for some uh, apartment uh, to live through the winter. Uh, Евгений, вы, вы сами чи с семьей, как, как вам, как, как доля вас uh, закинула в Киев? В каком uh, складе? Конечно, я с женой. Дети как бы взрослые, они живут самостоятельно и самостоятельно обустраивают свою судьбу. А мы с женой ищем жилье в Киеве и параллельно я в Тернопольской области пытаюсь организовать снова производство посадочных материалов. So, uh, uh, Yevhen is with his wife in Kyiv. Uh, his children are already grown up and they can take care of themselves. So, uh, he and his wife are trying to find a place to live, but meanwhile, he uh, is uh, in connection with the Ternopil uh, University, trying to set up similar facility, the nursery facility, uh, like he had in Bakhmut, so in, to restart the business. Євгене, розкажіть, як це все взагалі відбувалося з початку війни для вас? Я знаю, що ми з вами зізвонювалися з 2014 року, ви казали, що ці військові дії йдуть далі, але от, на жаль, воно таки не настигло вас. Розкажіть, будь ласка, що вам довелося пережити цього року? Відомо, саме драматичні моменти життя, чому? Тому що ну, потеряно все, практически и бизнеса, и жилья, ну, которое создавалось 47 лет. Давайте я перекладу. I asked, yes. so, uh, since 2014 we've been in touch, and you mentioned that active war was going on a little further. You heard, but uh, it wasn't so close, these explosives. But this year everything changed. So, Tell, uh, tell us what, what have you lived through this, this year? So the answer is that uh, uh, I have lost, uh, I have lived through the most dramatical uh, years of my life because we've lost everything that we were accumulating, building and gaining over 47 years. 
А е, коли саме е, підійшла фактично е, армія до вас, до, до Бахмута? Ну, практично, з, видимо, з періоду середини апреля. Чому? Тому що ми в апреле виконали весь комплекс полевих робот, посадили питомники, викопали саженці. Uh-huh. А от в кінці апреля ну, приблизилась вот ця лінія как бы, розділення, почалися розриви слышні. Ну а 24-го, там, 26-го, ну, в принципі, на підприємстві були прильоти значительні з розрушеннями. І 28-го я з женою винуджен був уїхати з Артемовська. Uh, so in uh, in the beginning of April they were a- still able to do the, some field works they uh, uh, settled the uh, young trees uh, planted and uh, uh, prepared the beds for the new year for the season uh, and planted the new seedlings uh, but in on the 22nd the uh, war line approached the city the, the city of Bakhmut and then on the 28 24th there were a couple of serious uh, uh, missile hittings of his uh, facilities uh, that pr- brought a lot of damage, serious damages to the facility. So they decided to leave and they left on the 28th of April. Вы кажете, вы фактически там пару дней, эти пару дней вам треба было закрыть справы, вы якось консервовали виробництво, как люди взагалі, працівники? Ну, практически я уезжал последний из предприятия, потому что люди до этого уехали. Вот. Ну, частями сначала. Часть uh-huh. людей оставалась, тем не менее. После этих прилетов мы навели порядок на территории. Ну, как бы разобрали эти завалы, для того, чтобы можно было заехать пожарным машинам. Так? Потом uh-huh. забрали часть документов, и предприятие практически прекратило существовать. So uh, I asked, uh, uh, on the 24th of April, the missile hit the facility, but you left on the 28th. You took a couple of days to uh, uh, free, uh, l- let the people go and to uh, kind of like uh, close the facilities, the, the remaining facilities. He said that, first of all, the people started leaving uh, earlier and he was the last to leave his uh, nursery. Yeah. Uh, uh, and... Uh, uh-huh. They uh, they cleaned after the first explosion. Я слышу. Алло, алло. Да, я, я тут, я тут, Иван. Чуете зараз? Алло. Алло, алло. It looks like he's not hearing. He cannot hear me. Иван, чуете меня? Роман, я вас не слышу. Алло, алло. Переподключиться. Hello. So he said that he was the last to leave uh, and uh, uh, he cleaned everything uh, and uh, allowed the possibility for the firefighting equipment to come into the facility. They took some papers, they locked all the other doors and they left. This is how the facility stopped, ceased, so to say, existence. Hello, you can hear me now? It looks like we lost connection with him just a second. Да, а попробуйте ще раз перепідключитися. So I asked him to try to reconnect. So as you... Oh, да, зараз чути, да. Ви чуєте мене? Супер, я переключився. Да, да, да. Окей, so а скільки взагалі людей працювало у вас на, на підприємстві? У нас працювало 180 чоловік. So this is the facility that employed да. 180 people. І uh-huh. це був один із крупних питомників на Україні. Мы so производили it, около миллиона саженцев. It was one of the biggest uh, facilities 
of this kind in Ukraine nurseries. They were producing about one million of young trees per year. У нас был полностью производство укомплектовано современной техникой, холодильниками, оборудованием, помещением, орошением. We were equipped with the latest equipment for like refrigerators, the machinery, the irrigation. Everything was imported and of the latest models. А зараз є якась інформація по тому, в якому стані зараз перебуває ваше господарство? Хтось там наглядає? Да, конечно, є там люди, которые наблюдают, но урожай земляники мы уже не собирали. Это 200 тонн ягод. Потом пшеницу мы не убирали. Ну, теперь я так думаю, что не будем убирать подсолнечник и не будем выкапывать саженцы. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the plants are still in the field, and I asked if there is anybody there watching how the facility is doing, how the fields are go, uh, uh, growing. So he said that they have not. There are people who are paying visit on a regular basis to the facility. They are not harvesting the uh, strawberries. They have not harvested, did not. I'm sorry, harvest strawberries, which was two hundred uh, tons. Uh, they uh, will. They did not harvest wheat, and probably they will leave sunflower uh, also in the field, and will not be harvesting the young trees. So everything is just naturally grow, keeps naturally growing. А скажіть, у вас скільки всього там гектар, і ви таку велику кількість назвали культур? Це всі возміння повинно бути, да? Там скільки знаю? Да, всі всі возміння. Ну і пшениці под солнечника у нас небольшое количество, где-то по 200 гектаров. Они все обороты. А ще ми обрабатували 800 гектарів землі. So the total acreage of their farmland is 800 hectares of land. Uh, they had about 200 of wheat, 200 of sunflower, because this is a must to have this crop rotation for the uh, uh, nursery, for the uh, fruit trees. Therefore, they had no choice but to grow these crops. А як відносно ситуації з попаданнями? Це було тільки два попадання і все? Більше розрушень не було? Нет, попадания были и потом, разрушения много, ну, процентов 60 зданий разрушено. Это просто на ту дату, когда мы там находились. Вот. А потом этот процесс просто развивается, и там ну, сейчас находятся военные, они стреляют, по ним стреляют. Ну, в общем, такой mm -hmm. so процесс, asked... процесс не завершился, разрушение. So uh damages uh that were done in april were the only ones unfortunately not uh the uh, military they have uh, uh, settled there in that facility and of course when they should ukrainians ukrainians should back and the process of damaging the facilities is still going on it's uh, currently about 60 percent of the premises that were destroyed uh, but it's still not over, and Russians are still there. А взагалі у вас є якась, ну, тобто, коли прийшли війська туди, вони якісь вимоги виставляли, вони, як вони відносяться до людей там на місці, і яка ситуація з, так би мовити, переговорним цим? Чи можна, скажімо так, з ними про щось домовлятися взагалі? Алло? Yuhan, it looks like Yuhan was disconnected. I was going to ask if there is any way to negotiate. Aha, uh -huh, here he is, rejoining. I was going to ask if there is any way to negotiate with the military in this area uh, for them not to destroy or uh, to hear their demands, um, but uh, let, let, let him answer. Yvonne, do you hear me now? Yes, now there are problems with the connection. I understand. I was asking if there was any possible way to make a conversation with the military, or if they were making some demands, and how they were actually standing up to people who live there. Are there still people there? 
Да, конечно. Ну, обычные человеческие взаимоотношения, вот, которые имеют все стороны сложности взаимоотношений, а так, ну, как бы люди потихоньку уезжают, потому что практически там невозможно находиться, потому что нет воды, света, электричества. Во всем, во всем Бахмуте. Да, во всем Бахмуте. И поэтому там остались самые такие обреченные люди, которым, которых нет денег, некуда выезжать. Little budget uh, that they can afford, they, they stay there. А в військові по відношенню до вас, до власника підприємства, якісь висували вимоги, наприклад, там надати їм техніку, чи надати їм дизель, чи цей переоформити це все на Росії на Росію, тому що я чув з Херсона, то фермерські господарства заставляють переоформляти на Росію. Таких не было? Нет, так а мы... Again, again problem with the connection. Алло, да. да. Мы, мы находимся на украинской до сих, до территории до сих пор. Ага, то есть это еще не Бахмут, да. не, не Просто у нас там проходит вот линия разделения до сих пор. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked if there were any demands from Russian side about, for example, re-registration uh, of the farms uh, in Russian uh, in Federation, just like they are doing in Kherson. But uh, this, uh, this is still the front line. So it's not yet occupied by Russians. So Bakhmut is uh, the, the area where he, he is... Uh, Uh, where is his facility uh, nursery is still the active war zone and nobody gained it so that's why it's so devastated uh, я зрозумів а в, uh, ну, в принципі які тут ще можуть бути питання uh, наскільки uh, вас тепло, тепло приймають в Тернопільській області це ще так розумію, ви, ви поїхали в університет якийсь, правильно я розумію? Ну, я був в університеті, а зараз я на крупному фермерському господарстві, радушний прийом, обеспечили якими-то умовами для життя, роботи. Ну, в принципі, таке розуміння є ситуації, угу. тому ну, все как бы, складається з перспективою. Uh, I asked how you were welcomed at, in the western uh, part of Ukraine, uh, in Ternopil Oblast. Probably you uh, are starting with the university facilities, uh, this new nursery. He said that uh, he visited the university, but uh, now he's working with the uh, bigger, one of the biggest farmers there, and uh, they have provided him with everything that... Uh, Uh, is necessary and there is some hope for the future uh, by the way i would like to uh, s uh, pay your attention that uh, Yuhan speaks russian i speak ukrainian ternopil oblast speaks ukrainian and there is no problem between our communication i was friends with Yuhan for years and you see now he uh, has found uh, shelter in um, ternopil in the center of ukrainian speaking people so What Russia has been claiming has never been true. Я кажу, я звернув зараз увагу, тому що часто чув таке, що ви говорите російською мовою, я українською, в Тернополі україноговорящі, проблем взагалі ніяких немає. Ми як один народ, одна, ну, якби ніколи не було таких проблем, так як заявляли з цієї сторони, що на, на підґрунті мови ми, у нас конфлікти виникають. Ви ще там чуєте мене, Євген? Так, да, я слышу, да. слышу. Ну, тоді, в принципі, якщо в мене, мене запитань немає, if anyone has any questions to Євген, uh, please go ahead. Other than that, uh, we will be uh, finishing to our interview with Євген for today. 
Зараз чекаємо, можливо, хтось запитання якісь задасть. So here are the damages done to his facilities, and you see the young trees, the seedlings are growing. Добре, Євгене, дякую вам за да, те, що добре, приєдналися. Да. Всього найкращого. Да, Сподіваюся, всього що да, колись у да. вас буде можливість повернутися туди і Спасибо. будуть Очень інвестиції надеюсь. на відновлення. Саме головне. Спасибо. З вашим досвідом, да. я думаю, ви будете перші в черзі. Спасибо. Спасибо. Щасливо, всього найкращого. Да, удачі вам, до свидання. So I said that with your experience, hopefully soon this territory will be regained and you will have the investments, the uh, uh, money coming from abroad, and you will be the first to be trusted for rebuilding. So now I would like to finish with just mentioning who we work uh, on this World to Rebuild Rural Ukraine with, with the three aid recipients and what we have gained uh, recently. Uh, so first of all, we have totally collected uh yeah this is uh first aid recipient kokosha allah uh she lost her house on march 28th and uh, at the beginning we were going to rebuild this house it was already approved with the uh, board of ambassadors but it was just in august that she said that there is hope government will help her rebuild but it might take years so we focused instead on this uh secondary house that has also the bathroom three head uh, kitchen bathroom and three rooms that's what we are working on right now uh, the second is uh, the farmer who lost his facilities and who is uh, uh, responsible uh, for uh, at least a dozen workers and he he farms 500 hectares we succeeded finding this tractor for him uh, presented by uh, Viktor Borisov from the company Maiz. And it just right now I had a phone call from the transportation company, which I will call back uh, after the end of the session, uh, arranging it to be delivered to his farm. And the third is Irina Shevchenko. She is uh, milking cows uh, right now, eight cows. Uh, but before the war, she had also pigs and uh, chicken in this barn. It was totally destroyed on the 12th, 8th and 12th of March. Uh, missiles hit a couple of times the same barn. I don't know why was it so important for Russian uh, military to hit the barn with uh, swine. Maybe they wanted some barbecue. But anyway, this is the fact. She lost all her equipment, all the animals that were inside. And now we are trying to uh, rebuilt it. The budget for rebuilding that barn is 7,000. We have already found uh, uh, refrigerators for milk uh, for her uh, and uh, we have uh, found windows. These are the uh, sponsors who provided uh, those items for, for uh, her and for Allah too because windows can be used for the house. Uh, we are in the process of purchasing the uh, construction equipment uh, and materials for, for them. Other than that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I understand this is uh, early morning in on Friday and um, uh, I appreciate any uh, help from you in spreading the word about our biweekly, about our initiative and about the problems that Ukrainian family farms are coming through in this war. Our two main goals here are first of all to raise awareness about the problems in the rural ukraine due to the damages done by russian uh, military and secondly raise some money to help them rebuild if there is any way to invite more foundations we are open to provide any information and uh, to uh, help locate those who are most in need Thank you very much for everything and we will proceed. See you in two weeks with more information coming. And um, if you have any questions, I'm open right now. Other than that, we'll be finishing. It might be interesting to note he is located a bit east of Kramatorsk. Aha, uh -huh, yes, uh, Bakhmut is a little bit into, uh, from Kramatorsk. I, I don't know the actual situation in Kramatorsk right now, uh, uh, but uh, the, these cities are neighbors.
I recall Kramatorsk was one of the places that where the railroad station was hit by the Russian um, bombs a while back. Yes, yes, that's that's right. Unfortunately, but this was not the only one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, like I said, thank, we are grateful to all the allies who are supporting us. All the best to you and to your families. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.